Hey guys, this is Onya. I'm making this video because I want to talk about today a concept known as minimalism. Sorry that I haven't been making videos in a while. I've been going through a, a lot of stuff, a lot of drama in my personal life, but I have still been meaning to do these videos for you guys. And so this particular subject has been on my heart recently. And I kind of want to talk about today in more detail this concept of minimalism. And so there's two things to keep in mind here. One is mandatory minimalism and then voluntary minimalism. So the scriptures actually teach in general that everyone is supposed to practice a form of minimalism. The basic idea is that it is a sin. It's not just oh, it's not it's not just uh, less preferable, but it's actually a sin for anyone to be rich in the eyes of the Creator, in the eyes of God. And and what does it mean to be rich in His eyes? Basically, having a bunch of stuff, keeping it for yourself, not sharing it with others, and hoarding goods for selfish purposes. So uh, I can uh, give you an example. So for example, say you have five cars. That is a sin. It's not just uh, not ideal. It's a sin if you have five cars for yourself. Now if you have five cars, let's say you have, let's say you have five kids and you have five cars. You're the owner, but you have five kids and you have your kids use one car per each person. Now that is different because you're not hoarding it for yourself. You're sharing it with other people. Abraham was considered rich, but what did, what did Abraham have? Abraham had over a thousand servants that he had to feed and take care of. So if you think like in American uh, money, like in, in the U.S. right now, you kind of need, let's say, for how much you need for food, um, you need something like, I don't know, uh, a couple thousand dollars a year for food, sometimes more, sometimes a little less, but, you know, it's well over a thousand dollars for food per person. So... If you have a thousand people, over a thousand people like Abraham did, and you have to feed them all, that means you need to be making one million dollars at least every year to feed them. So, or to have an equivalent monetary production on your own, such as a farm or something. But basically, you have to have the goods, enough goods. You have to be rich enough to give everyone their basic necessities. And that's a lot of money, and, or a lot of goods, a lot of value. So people like Abraham, you know, you might cite, cite people like Abraham as someone who was rich, and therefore, because Abraham was rich, it's okay for us to be rich and hoard goods for ourselves, but Abraham was not rich, because how are you rich if you, for example, if someone gives you a million dollars, and then you give all that money away, and every year you're given a million dollars, but every year you give it all away, you're not rich because you're, you're distributing it. You're not keeping it for yourself. Someone's rich if they have it and they keep it. So that's an example. And you have the various kings, like King David. They had a lot of money and possessions and goods, but they also used it to help others. They didn't hoard it for themselves not every king, uh, the kings that were righteous uh, did not hoard it for themselves. But you have people like uh, King Solomon who did hoard things for himself. He was a selfish and sinful king, as we know from the scriptures. But David was a man after God's own heart, and so he did not hoard riches for himself. He was a very humble man. So this principle is very important. And then there's so many passages of scripture which speak about this. Uh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom 
of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And what else do I lack? The, the man asked the Messiah, what else do I lack? I've done the commandments. What do I need to do in order to be saved? And he said, go sell all that you have and follow me. Because he hoarded stuff for himself. So that 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 just this and as many other passages just illustrates to us that to be rich, truly rich, is a sin. But to have goods for yourself uh, in moderation, in correspondent to what you need, or what is uh, fair for you to have, then it's okay. So that's the that's the whole idea of of mandatory minimalism where you have only what you need and only what is uh, for all the things you want only just the minimum of what you want and no more because you have more then it's not then it's going beyond the requirements of the Creator. And not only that, but everything you do have for yourself, you do need to share with others. So let's say you have a car. You don't need to use your car today, but someone else needs help. You either need to give them a ride or let them borrow your car. If they're in, in need, you have to share what you have with others to really help people. And so th these are important principles that we must live by. But there's also something called voluntary minimalism, and that is going beyond what Scripture requires of you to really do good to help people. That's kind of what I want to talk about today, especially, because what should be our goal in our lives as followers of the Bible, as followers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what is our goal? Our goal is to help people, to help the world. And how do we do that? We don't do that by hoarding things for ourselves. We don't do that for only thinking about ourselves. We have to look out for the needs of others. We have to, we have to live according to the principles of communism. And there are so many principles in Scripture, uh, there's so many things in Scripture which endorse and support the concept of communism with capitalist elements mixed in because really a lot of people misunderstand the biblical concept of communism. There, there are many capitalist elements in biblical communism, but it, the, when you follow biblical communism, it really unites people. And so, well, before I get into some of this, uh, let me just talk about money for first because take a look at all the rest of creation. All the rest of creation. Angels, animals, plants. None of them need money. None of them use money for anything. And they live just fine. They have societal harmony. And there are a lot of... They, they look out for each other. They take care of each other. So, of course, it's not all happy, happy in the animal kingdom. There's also a lot of sin and violence in among the animals against their own kind and against other animals so so we have to understand that um, the just, just just like how the animals do not need money we do not need money either so how did money get invented this cruel, sick, disgusting concept of money came from somewhere. Now, the scriptures endorse the concept of money, but why does it do that? So, basically, the scriptural perspective is that money is a necessary evil. Now, evil, of course, in scripture is used in a broad sense and does not exclusively refer to moral evil always. So, it doesn't always mean something sinful. But evil can also be something uh, horrible but technically is not wrong per se. It's not morally wrong, but it is evil because of its, 
its ten tendency to result in bad consequences and bad things. But basically, because humans started getting greedy and couldn't agree on on things and they were fighting over goods, they couldn't share, like little baby kids, they couldn't share, so people invented the concept of money as a way of creating peace and harmony and trying to prevent total and utter chaos, basically anarchy, because there was no means of determining who gets what, who should get what. So they devised the idea of money as a way of, okay, well, if so-and-so has this much money, then they're entitled to these goods and, and whatnot. And so that's kind of how money came into existence. If you look back in the beginning, Adam and Eve did not have money. Then they had their kids. Who, let's say you, ha you live on an island and you have kids. Are you going to charge them money for stuff? Who in the world would, in their right mind, would do that to their own kids? Why would you, you know, you, you have two sons. You say, okay, um, I'm going to charge you now for the food. So if you want to eat, you have to pay me money. Who does that to their own kids? Now, it makes sense to do that in our society because it's, it costs money to, to pay them uh, to, give, to get food. So if your kids are adults and, and you need help with the groceries, then it makes sense to, to ask your kids, okay, guys, uh, give me some money for, so I can get the food for you guys. That's fine. But in the original origin of creation... There was no societal system of money. And so it would make total nonsense for Adam and Eve after Seth and Cain become adults to say, okay, guys, now that you're adults, it's time you got to pay me money. Money didn't even exist at the time. So they'd be like, money, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, well, uh, basically because you guys are adults, um, you have to... Give me stuff if you want me to do stuff for you. Who does that? That's just kind of disgusting to do that to your own kids. Uh, to invent money to control them? That's disgusting. It only makes sense in a society that already has money because... Um, let's say, for example, someone has 100 kids. Uh, that's pretty high, and most people would never have that many kids. But if you have 100 kids, it's very unfair to think that they would have the ability to feed all of them with their own money. So it's fair for them to expect their kids to help out with money to, in order to pay for the food. So, but again, in, without the system of money set up, it makes no sense for a parent to invent the concept. Just like animals never invented this concept. So, so now, now you have grandkids. Would you do that to your grandkids? No. Great grandkids? Probably not still. But oh, now from then on you would do it? Because why? But they're, they're your descendants. And what about your cousins? Would you do it to your cousins? What about your first cousins, your second cousins? It doesn't really make sense to implement this idea at any stage of the world because we are all family. We are all related to each other. So we should be treating each other as family and not as people to take advantage of. The whole system of money is a, is a scheme to take advantage of other people. It was invented to, as a necessary evil to restrain sin. And those who are righteous can use money, but they must use it for good. And they must find a way to manipulate the system of money to maximize the good that they can do to help people. So, in the ideal world, do you think in eternal life there's going to be money? No, that's the dumbest thing in the world. There's not going to be money in the eternal age, in the kingdom of God. There will not be money. So, if there's not going to be money in the eternal age, why are we okay with doing this whole money concept in our time. We're only okay with it because society tells us we have to. And it's because of the people in charge. And the people 
and not only that, but there enough of the population believes in the system of money that they will never want to get rid of the concept because they're greedy and selfish. But truly selfless people who want good and righteousness for all will despise the concept of money. They will hate it and they will think it is evil. And I believe it is one of the most evil things in the world. Money corrupts people in a disgusting and disturbing way. But again, Scripture says it's okay because in te technicality, yes, there's nothing wrong with money per se, but it's so abused, it's so disgustingly twisted that it should never have been invented. But it had to be invented because of sin. That's, that's what it boils down to. So, so in some ways... Capitalism in our society resulted because communism was too extreme for people. But that's no excuse because God commands us that despite having money, we must live by the principles of communism. So we either have to change society to become communist or we must set up our own uh, groups and implement systems of communism in the world. And that's what my goal is in my life, is to create communism and spread it everywhere. Okay? So, with that said, think about it. If you have, a, uh, if you have billions of dollars and you're just keeping it for yourself, how are you a good person? You're not. you got to help people. you got to share your wealth with others. So, any wealth we are given we must use to help others and excuse me um, so the basic minimalist requirements are for all and we must live communist lifestyle that is required of everybody but it goes beyond that because now you can do even better you don't have to just do the minimum effort you don't have to do the minimum minimal, you know, the minimum minimalism. You could do the maximum minimalism. And the maximum minimalism is very interesting because it is very doable, it's practical, it makes sense. There's so many um, superior aspects of a maximum minimalist approach. And so what that basically is, is uh, I will illustrate some certain things for you. So, now when you guys, if you guys buy a house, what do you do? You, you look for a, you look for furniture, right? So you look for a table, you look for chairs, you look for a bed, you look for a TV, you look for this, you look for that, da 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 da, da, da right? You look for everything that, that you're supposed to get. Well, what if I were to tell you you don't need those things? So, what about a table? No, you don't need a table. What? You don't need a table. That doesn't make sense. Well, let me tell you how you don't need a table. In the ancient times, people did not always use tables. Many times, people would just sit together in a group, sit in the chairs, and eat in the chairs. Or in couches, which were somewhat chairs in the ancient times. So, so allow me to bring you the concept of, okay, people just sit down in chairs with a plate on their lap, or a bowl, and they eat from the plate or the bowl without a table. Isn't that amazing? So you don't need a table. Now, another thing is, when you eat inside, it attracts pests, it attracts bugs, it attracts rats and other rodents in your home. They, they want to live in your home because there's food in your home. And it's very wasteful, too, to just have food all over the place and then and, and, and then when they when they want to be there you don't like that and you kill the animals you kill the rats you kill the bugs because they all they're trying to get is food but you're so selfish that you won't let them have the food and you won't share your home with these creatures so a better way to do it is eat outside if you eat outside set set chairs outside eat in your chairs and then what happens 
the crumbs from the food will fall onto the ground and then the bugs on the ground outside of your house will eat the food outside the the rodents will eat the food outside they will not come into your house for food there will be no food in your house I mean you could store food in containers in your house but you would not have any open food there so imagine if people started doing that there were so many problems of house invaders of creatures would would not exist you just have everything outside for food when you eat it so and then and um, when you're inside you don't need chairs inside really for the most part so you could have basically a cushion on the floor and sit on the cushion on the floor you don't need couches okay you don't need couches you don't need a TV if you have a computer it should be should be sufficient you don't need a computer and a TV the TV is nonsense for phones, you don't need a landline anymore. You could have your cell phone. Okay, cell phone is entirely sufficient. No more uh, landlines are even needed anymore. Um, and <clears throat> what about a bed? People love beds. Well, I still haven't gotten to get rid of my bed yet. That's a goal I have someday to get rid of a bed. My uh, the need for a bed. I'm trying to find a way to be comfortable without a bed. Uh, eventually, I hope to attain that. It's a work in progress. But I will tell you that I have successfully eliminated the need for a pillow. Most people could not think of, what? You don't sleep with a pillow? How, how can that be? That doesn't make sense. Well, the fact is that I have slept very comfortably without a pillow for many years. It's been, I don't know how many years, but it's been a long time. No pillows at all, okay? So you can get rid of that pillow. You don't need a pillow. And then for beds, you know, a lot of people suffer health problems because they're lying on their back, straight on their back on the, on their bed. It's actually, especially as you get older, it makes it harder to breathe. So if you were sleeping at an elevated angle, like in a chair or something, it would help in many ways, especially as you get older with your... Uh, ability to breathe. So that, that's an a, a important thing to, to keep in mind. And th there's just so many other things you can do. And, and the thing, that, the reason I say all these things is because I want to have a, com a community. I want to have lots of people live together. So how does it make sense? It, we're, we're trying to help as many people as possible. So if I'm trying to help as many people as possible, you've got um, you, you have like, let's say you have a million people. Does it make sense to have, to buy a million beds for everybody? That's dumb. That, that wastes so much money. You could use that money. Like take, take that money. Okay. Uh, you got, let, let's just, uh, keep it simple and say $100 for a bed. Often they could be more than that, but let's just keep it simple and say $100 for bed. You have a million people. Each one needs a bed, $100 per bed. You've just spent $100 million for a bed that you didn't even need. So get rid of the bed. No one needs a bed. You just saved 100 million people, uh, 100, 100 million dollars. And now that $100 million can go to help more people. Same thing with tables and chairs. You don't need all that stuff. Just be a minimalist. Get rid of all that stuff, and the more stuff you get rid of that you don't really need, you can help more people. Now, things like the computer, the internet, they're not easily replaceable like that, because these are things which are so convenient, so essential. If you get rid of the computer, that's a huge loss. It's a huge loss. Um, there are many things you cannot do without a computer. But for a bed, if you get rid of a bed, that's not much of a loss at all. You get rid of your table, that's not much of a loss at all. You get rid of chairs, not much of a loss at all. Get rid of the things that aren't much of a loss, and you improve your life significantly, and you help other people. You improve their lives significantly. You, what about cars? I do not have a car, and I do not intend to ever have a car for myself. I might buy cars for other people, and I might buy a car for the community. There might be a designated driver to help transport people in our community to various places. But as of right now, I walk places, I jog places, I take the bus, 
and I am open in the future to riding my bike. There may be times where I could take a train places or take a boat if I'm crossing waters. I am very much iffy with planes. I do not like planes at all. I don't really want to ever go on a plane again. I, I might in the future, but I really despise planes. And, um, yeah, I despise cars as well, but I understand that cars are so important in our society. I believe in going the route of cleaner energy, clean energy like solar energy and, and stuff like that, and renewable resources. And so for cars, there are electric-powered cars, there are solar-powered cars. I want to get a car like that to help, you know, the environment and to, to pr eliminate waste and and then eventually it will be self-driving cars the thing the reason I hate cars is because there's so many innocent people die but um, and so much harm and damage is caused by cars basically cars are in many ways again a necessary evil in our society but you can if you can make it work without cars then do it You'll save so much money, you can help more people. You don't need a car, it's a luxury. Um, carpool with people. So find someone that you're close to that will give you a ride. Pay them some money, it's gonna help them out. You pay them some money, they're gonna feel good for helping you. You help them, everyone wins, and and you save so much money. And, um, and then with houses, what kind of house do you need? You can get a big house, doesn't make sense to get a big house though. Get a small tiny house that's enough for what you need and get rid of all the extra stuff that you don't need. And so like in, in the future you know I want to buy a very simple house. Of course it, it depends you know if you marry someone and they're not on board with things then you kind of have to do stuff that they'll be happy with which is very frustrating. And that's what Paul speaks about in his letters in the New Testament, how he says, when you're married, you can't think about the things of God as much. You have to focus on what your spouse wants, um, because that's a role, that's a responsibility of a married couple, that you are supposed to look for your the wants and needs and interests of your partner. So if your spouse wants a car, or your spouse wants a nicer house, you kind of have to go along with it, um, in some ways, but if you're not married or if you have a partner who's on board with you, then you could do so much good by getting rid of a car, having a very basic house. There's just so many ways you can cut expenses, and we live in a society that encourages us to waste our money so much, and people are in so much debt because they can't manage their finance, manage their finances. Okay, so we got to work together. Communism is the way to get out of horrible stuff that our society has. Fix the problems of the world by getting rid of what we don't need and then working together to help each other overcome poverty, overcome sickness, and overthrow the system, uh, the corrupt system, and really truly change the world and society as we know it. Now we know that we can't change the course that has been predestined by God there will be destruction of this world. There will be corruption and evil. It will not stop. Poverty will not be removed. Corruption will not be removed. Things will get worse. The world will get worse. More people will die. The world will be total and utter chaos. But we have a duty to minimize that. Okay? We have a duty to minimize that as much as we can, save as many people as we can in the time of darkness, in the time of destruction. We are in the last days. We don't have much time left. According to my calculations, we have about 160 years until the Messiah comes back and sets up the 1,000 year reign in the Millennial Kingdom. So in the next 160 years, we have a lot of work we gotta do. There's going to be so many people born in the next 160 years. It's, it's mind-boggling. Billions and billions and billions of people will be born. So we have a fresh 
field of people that need salvation, that need help, not just spiritual help, but physical help. They, they need money, they need food, they need shelter. We are the generation to bring about this change. We need to implement the concepts of communism in our society. We need to spread it everywhere. We need to help people. We cannot do this alone. We have to do this together. So please, if you believe in this message, consider helping me, consider joining me in this cause of spreading communism and becoming a min minimalist and just making the world a better place, changing it for the good. And through God, all things are possible. So let us do the impossible. Let us change the world. Let us do the best we can to give people food, give people shelter, and give people a community that loves them and respects them and treats them as they deserve to be treated, but also maintains justice and order and punishes those who deserve to be punished by sending them to their appropriate punishments like jail time or death penalty for certain things like murder and such. So, um, you can connect me if you're interested in supporting this or if you have more questions. If there are some things that are, let's say you like what I say, but there are some things that concern you or you're not sure about, you want to know more, you want to criticize what I say or challenge any aspects, leave a comment below in my video. Comment to your heart's content. Even if you want to say this is a stupid video, feel free free will for you guys. I don't censor comments. The only comments that are censored are automatic. If it, if the system of YouTube identifies automatically that certain comments are spam or that they are very harassing, like they have systems in place to automatically flag things. So those are the only times things get censored on the channel. But otherwise, I don't censor comments, so please, please just uh, say whatever's on your mind. And I hope some of you guys will be inspired by this message and will join me in this mission to help people. That's all I want to do. I just want to help people. And no one wants to help. No one wants to help me do this. I need your guys' help. I can't do it alone. I'm trying to do it alone, but it's just not working. Please, people, consider joining my cause and helping me to implement communism in the con in the context of a biblical Dead Sea Scrolls uh, worldview. That's all I have to say. Thank you for watching this video, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And just God bless you guys. Shalom.